of the uh, uh, of the talks. Um, so uh, uh, you will be able to actually uh, hear, hear the talks, and people who are not able to get on the talk will be able to see it again on uh, to see it after the talk. Um, we have a quite a nice list of uh, talks for the coming weeks. We are still building it, and we hope you will like all our lecturers. Uh, and I guess uh, uh, this is more or less what I wanted to say before introducing the lecturer. Uh, just a few quick instructions for the talk itself. Uh, we would like to have a uh, brief uh, questions and answers uh, um, um, uh, session after the talk. But during the talk, I would like to ask all of you to keep your uh, microphone on mute so that there will be no disruptions or interruptions. And if you have a question, there is a chat uh, button. Please press the chat button and, uh, and just say, I have a question. And then uh, at the end of the talk, I will try to look at the chat uh, screen and just ask you one by one, ask your name, and then you can unmute your microphone, or I can actually, maybe I can unmute you, but better that you unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, please try not to write, please try at this moment to stop using the chat window to chat between yourself, because that will interrupt us from seeing who is asking a question. Just use the chat window for telling me that you have a question that we will, and we will turn to you at the end of the talk. Okay. So with that, I would like to turn uh, to the talk of today, which is going to be given by Professor Jane Clark from the University of Cambridge. Jane, are you there? I am, thank you, yes. Okay, okay for one moment, I didn't see you. So Jane uh, is uh, currently the president of Wolfson College in uh, uh, the University of Cambridge. Jane was for many years a professor in the Department of Chemistry at the university, and I assume she's still affiliated with the department. She actually started uh, her career as an undergraduate student in the University of York, and then uh, for many years uh, was a uh, teacher, a high school teacher, and uh, came back to science in the end of the 90s, graduated in 1993 with a PhD from the group of Alan First in Cambridge, and stayed there as an independent researcher, and she became very quickly a stellar scientist with amazing achievements in protein folding using a diverse set of tools. She is very well known for the introduction of AFM as a tool for uh, protein folding. She's well known for studies of uh, uh, multiple domains and how they are affecting the folding of proteins. And she's well known for the recent studies on intrinsically disordered proteins and how binding can affect uh, their folding behavior. Uh, so uh, Jane uh, received many accolades for all of these uh, great achievements, and I would like to just mention two of them. Uh, uh, she received a, uh, an award from the Biophysical Society in 2010, the U.S. Genomics Award, and in 2015 she was elected to the um, Royal Society uh, in the U.K. This is one of the oldest, or maybe the oldest, uh, Society uh, of Scientists, uh, of preeminent scientists, and so Jane is, is, uh, uh, is a fellow of that society since 2015. So today, uh, Jane, uh, uh, here's Jane, and you will see her in, uh, in, in a real video in a minute, and Jane will tell us today about making sense of disorder. So again, thank you all for joining this uh, meeting, and uh, I'm sure this will be a great talk. Uh, so please, Jane, feel free to start. I'm stopping sharing this, and you can share your uh, screen. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I hope I can move this out the way. Um, well, thank you all. Thank you for coming. I've turned me off on my picture so you can't see me. Um, very pleased to be invited. Hagen, uh, Gilad, Ben, thank you so much for organizing this. It's such a brilliant idea. I am so missing 
uh, the, the community now. And so this is a real opportunity. So disorder, we all know what disorder feels like. We're, we're, we're feeling it at the moment, but I, I thought I'd talk about a time when disorder is more useful. Um, uh, now, oh yes. Uh, so I want to first of all thank everybody that did it. Several of these people are in the audience, I've noticed. So hello to all of you. It's nice to see you again. Um, and, and work done by, by this team in Cambridge. And I have shut my lab down now. Um, so uh, it's nice to be able to talk about And But some of this isn't published yet, just through my inefficiency. So let's go. Um, disorder in biology. I hope that I can persuade you today that, that disorder is actually not always a bad thing. Disorder can be of use. Um, and, and I suppose in biology, really, I first, reflecting for this talk, I actually first came across the role of disorder when I was studying Titan um, in about the year 2000, so 20 years ago. Um, Titan as a, is a giant muscle protein, and I was interested in it because of these immunoglobulin-like domains that it's made up of this tandem arrays. But in Titan was this PEVK region, um, which I now know, but I didn't then, is a signature of a disordered region, being rich in proline, uh, glutamate, lysine, and a very small hydrophobic. So, so it's really got the signature um, of a disordered protein. And uh, this work from Julio Fernandez's lab here showed very clearly that the point of PEVK is to be an entropic spring. And it can be such a great spring. You can see here that the, the retraction and the release, it springs back the moment you release the force. There's no hysteresis. And PEVK is a protein, a part of a disordered region of protein, which requires to be disordered in order for it to work. There are other really fantastic examples, like um, the example of the nuclear pore complex. I mean, everybody that loves structural biology must love this structure uh, done by cryoEM, where you can see the all the proteins that make up the core, except that there's a big hole in the middle. And yet we know that this pore is exquisitively um, um, specific and only allows particular uh, things into and out, of, and out of the nuclear pore. And that's because it's filled with a ring of disordered nuclear porins. They're called FG nuts. That tells you something about them. Uh, they have tiny little motifs, specific motifs, FG, phenylalanine glycine. And the role of this is to act as a filter. And in some work, which I don't intend to tell you about, but advertising uh, that, that Sarah Shamas did uh, with uh, Martin Blackledge, Frauke Greater, and Edward Lemke in their lab, um, we were able to show that having these disordered nuts with this tiny, really weak individual binding sites could lead to really rapid transport and specific transport through this pore. So again, this is a case where we need to be disordered to be active. And of course, I've done nothing on phase transition, but this is for all my friends out there uh, in this audience who, who are interested in phase transition. And disordered proteins are really essential for forming these membrane-less um, organelles within cells, which can allow for really rapid uh, responses to changes in conditions with cells to release substrates or to sequester them. But I'm, I'm interested in protein folding. So the protein folding and dynamics bit, uh, you're starting off with somebody that's largely going to be interested in about protein folding. Uh, and so when we were studying these intrinsically disordered proteins, um, I wanted to really, really think about intrinsically disordered proteins that fold upon binding. So the question that I had about this was, well, if you're going to bind as a folded entity, why would you bother to be disordered in the first place? Why couldn't you just have a, 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 an ordered protein that binds when you require the signal to go ahead? And I mean, this is one of the questions that smarter people than me have asked. And one of the answers that, they, that, that, it, that is obvious is that disordered proteins allow 
promiscuous interactions and they allow complex networks of competing interactions to be built up. Um, and this family that, that, this is one of the families that, that is quite, um, uh, in, quite a model of this, is the BCL2 family. Now the BCL2 family consists of three kinds of proteins. You have got uh, some folded proteins, pro-survival folded proteins, and um, pro-apoptotic folded proteins, the back and the backs. And then you have disordered proteins, um, which, which are pro-apoptotic proteins that come in later. Now, what we know about these is that there are um, a large number of them, um, and that they all share the same motifs. So we have multi-motif proteins, I've just told you this, and the, and the disordered proteins. And you don't need to, to concentrate on this, on this slide, but what you need to know is that there are a lot of them. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to study, and, and all of them interact with all of them. So what we wanted to study, all the BH3 proteins interact with all the folded proteins, and we wanted to understudy, understand why and how. So one of the studies that we did was to take one folded protein, which is MCL1, and look at a number of BH3 only proteins, which are the peptides of, of which are here, and to look at their folding. Now, one of the things which was absolutely clear when we did this, and this was work by Lisa de Hull, who's in the audience. Hello, Lisa. Are you in your pajamas? I hope so, because it's seven in the morning where you are. Um, but um, we, we found that the affinity of these proteins uh, varied hugely from 30 picomolar up to hundreds of nanomolar. Um, so what was the basis for, the, for this difference in, in affinity? Well, um, if we looked at the rate at which these things bound, they all bound at more or less the same rate. A factor of 10 is all the difference between these. So they can all bind and they bind very, very fast of the order of, the order of about five, uh, five per micromole per second. So very fast, but their chaos are very different. So th their lifetime is very different. And you can see here that the KD is absolutely absolutely fit with the chaos. So in this system, and in fact, in every system that we've looked at, it's the lifetime of the competing complexes which is important. So what biology is seen to be doing is having systems with different lifetimes to control these signaling processes. And what is absolutely clear is that very small changes in affinity of one or two of the components can completely disrupt an entire signaling system. Another of the reasons which um, why things can be disordered is because they can respond very rapidly to changes in conditions. Um, and that's because intrinsically disordered proteins are exquisitely sensitive to changes in conditions. And I mean, Ben, well, I hope Ben will be giving us a talk later on in the series, but Ben's group have shown really well how the structure and the dynamics of these proteins can change significantly according to changes in conditions. The two I want to talk to you about to begin with is ionic strength and ion composition. Um, because we, we know that addition of salt can significantly affect the structure of IDPs. And those of you who know that intrinsically disordered proteins are, um, are, are highly charged will be going, well, no shit, Sherlock, of course they are. Um, if they're highly charged, they'll be different. But what Basil found when he did these experiments was something more interesting than that. What you can see here is a CD spectrum of the disordered protein Puma um, and the effect of, of adding salt. Now, um, at zero ionic strength, or as close to zero as we could get, uh, this disordered protein has a considerable amount of residual helicity. Um, uh, and and we've, see, we've also shown uh, um, in this, Joe Rogers showed with this, that, that the more helical this is, the tighter this, this, this thing binds. Now, but when we add salt, and all these are at one molar ionic strength, one molar ionic strength, I point out, 
not one molar concentration. So the calcium chloride would be 0.3 molar uh, about con um, concentration of this thing. What we find is that for um, sodium potassium chloride, we've lost a third of the ionic strength. But when we have calcium chloride, we lose a third this again. stupid. Jane's giving a talk on data. Hello, Susan. Sorry, I'm That's talking right. to my husband, not you. Sorry about that. Um, different sorts have got different, uh, different sorts have got different ionic strengths and it goes with the Hofmeister series. Um, and, and in fact, what we discovered then is that a decrease in helicity leads to a significant change in, in, the, in the association rate and thus the affinity. So therefore, changes in ionic strength can really affect the affinity of the protein. So we can change uh, the ionic strength or the ion composition and change the way this signaling happens. Ben has shown very clearly about effects of viscosity, temperature and pH. So one of the things that I wanted to reflect on is, I mean, this is all very interesting. I'm a biophysical scientist. I'm actually far more interested in the biophysics than I really am. Don't tell anybody. There's only 500 of you here I'm, I'm admitting this to. Really to actually the effect this has on the biology. But you do wonder, does this actually play, is this actually real in biology? So we were lucky when Basil published that paper, John Walker, um, who works on F1 ATPAs famously, um, came to see us and Basil and Vaituta in his group um, decided to have a look at a disordered protein which, which has, plays a controlling factor in F1 ATPAs. As you all know, um, there's a protomotive force which turns this rotary motor and causes ADP to be converted to ATP. Now the trouble is, if the PMF is dissipated, then the enzyme reverses its direction and starts to hydrolyze ATP. Um, now that's, that's fun um, in vitro, but in vivo, this is not what we want. And so this hydrolytic activity is inhibited by this, this protein IF1. Um, and what happens is that this will bind un under conditions um, where the PMF is dissipated, uh, this will bind to um, the active site on this rotor and prevent it from turning. And what we know is that the disordered region interacts with the regions of the cat catalytic site, becomes helical, folded upon binding to these sites uh, and, and then prevents the rotor from turning. What Vaituta and Basil were able to show was that there was changes in, in, in secondary structure induced in the disordered protein, which affected the assembly of the active dimers and the inactive tet tetramers of this disordered protein. And that this too was sensitive to changes in ionic strength and sensitive to changes in, in the type of iron. And we do know that in mitochondria, you get fluxes of calcium um, under certain conditions. And so in this piece of work, they were able to um, speculate that it's likely that, that this inhibition is actually modulated by pH and cation type. And it's because this, F, this IF1 has got a disordered region, which is so sensitive to changes in pH and salt, that it makes it capable to um, let the mitochondrion adapt to its, to its conditions in order to stop using up ATP when it doesn't need to. Um, there's another example where this is important in nature. Uh, and this is an example um, when we consider that it's not just the binding region of the IDP which is important, but it's, re it's, it's regions outside that which, which may be important here. Um, and a case in, in point is the case of P53-MDM2. I mean, you all know that P53 P, P is absolutely, absolutely central to apoptosis. Um, and it binds to MDM2, which is responsible for causing PD, uh, P53 to be broken down to control apoptosis. Um, there's a disordered region in P53 here, which forms a helix when it binds to MDM2. 
And out just in front of that helical region are two conserved prolines uh, here. Now, if you mutate those proline residues, can you take them to alanine, um, what you discover is an, an increase in intrinsic helicity in the helical region. So here's the helical region, here are the prolines that we've taken away, and we have an increase in the intrinsic helicity of this region which leads to a 10 times increase in the lifetime of the complex. Binds at about the same rate, um, but it, it lasts, the, 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 the complex lasts much, much longer. And Gary Dordrill, Phil Selenko and their colleagues showed that these substitutions actually impair P53's ability to, to promote cell cycle arrest inside cells. So small changes in conformation, small changes in there can lead to changes in lifetime, which can have real effects within the cells. So, but the last thing I want to talk to you about, and this is the unpublished part, so I have talked about this, is, um, is, is wondering about the presence of a membrane. And in order to look at this, I'm going to take you back to um, this system here, the, the um, BCL2 system. Now, what happens is in a case, when, when we're um, in a case of good health in normal cells, there's some sort of interaction between these pro-survival BCL2 proteins and the back and backs, which sequester back and backs and stop back and backs from punching holes in the mitochondrial membrane, causing the, the downstream effects on apoptosis. But on, on reception of, of uh, your cell damage, your intracellular damage, oncogenes turning on caspase system, these, these intrinsically disordered BH3 only proteins somehow interfere with this, cause back and backs to be released, and then they can punch holes in the mitochondria. So what we wanted to do was have a look at this interaction network and, and try and work out the mechanism for this. This is Basil Vicky's work mainly, and Basil's also, I suggest, in his pajamas because he's in Seattle. Hello, Basil. Um, so the, the system that we use is we've got MCL1 as our folded BH, BCL2 protein, back and backs, and Puma, and we also use BID as our, BID as our BH3 only proteins. Um, now, what we know is that in, when a cell's normal and happy, back and back interact with each other um, and the cell is happy. However, when Puma, for instance, is produced through the action of P53, back or backs can form these, um, it can some sort of pore which permeates, permeabilizes the mitochondrial outer membrane and we lead the cell to die. Now, what we do also know is that all of these have got BH3 motifs, which can interact with full length BH3 domains. So what we wanted to do was have a look at the strengths of these interactions. So, sorry about this, but it, it's quite a busy screen. So we looked at MCL1, binding all the different BH3 domains, and back binding all the different BH3 domains. What do we find? That MCL1 binds all these BH3 dom domains with high affinity sort of nanomolar affinity, whereas back and backs bind with hundreds of micromolar affinity. So very different affinities between these two homologous folded proteins for their BH3 partners. The on rates though are all the same. You see very, very similar on rates within about, about factor of 10, but their off rates vary by orders of magnitude here, by sort of seven orders of magnitude that their off rates vary by, which is, explains the difference in, in the KDs. Now, taking you back to this, remember, here is MCL1, here's back or backs, and they have an M, a BH3 motif here to which MCL1 combined with high nanomolar affinity. So we do the experiments and we find that full length back and backs do not interact with MCL1. We can leave them over a huge amount of time and they don't interact. So what's going on? Because, you know, 
we are told that there's an interaction between these which prevents back or backs from forming the pore. So what's going on here? Um, well, you could always say that, that, that good scientists also have to be lucky uh, and Basil here is very lucky um, because when he started making backs and set up doing this experiment, um, he simply couldn't make back or backs um, as a monomer. It was always oligomeric. And that was because when he was producing the protein, he always had a tiny, tiniest bit of tween in there, detergent in there, just trying to, um, uh, just to make sure that he didn't, wasn't sticky and so forth. And that actually what he found he had to do was to take away the detergent before he could get monomer. And here's a native mass spec, and I'm going to show you some mass spec here, which was done by Kalor Gupta, who's, who's now in Yale, but at the time was in Carol Robinson's lab in, in, in Oxford. And, and here's a native mass spec of Bax purified without detergent, and you can see it's all monomer. However, when you add detergent, and there's a number of different detergents we've tried, but this is mainly, the results here are mainly in tween. When you see detergent, what you can see is that, that back and backs oligomerize strongly, mainly multiples of two, four, six, and so on, some higher, uh, the odd three and five, but mainly this is the distribution that we get. Um, so this is to explain those results. Back or backs on its own, we only see monomer. Back or backs, either of them with detergent, we see multimers all, with, all the time. This is using mass spec. When we use um, size exclusion chromatography, we see all multimer. So, so we, we see all oligomer. But of course, in the mass spec, we'll, we'll get these broken down. Um, here, here, here's a mass spec showing you that. So if we've got, um, if, if, we, if we've got a small amount of tween, we get some monomer and some multimer. But when we've got a very small 1% amount of tween, we get all of it is oligomer. Interestingly, um, the others, the A1 and MCL1, two non-apoptic BCL2 things, they don't seem to form a oligomer in tween at all. The oligomerization is associated with a change in secondary structures. There is, there is some change in structure of both back and backs when they oligomerize. Uh, there's a large change in fluorescence, which you can see here, but actually that's the same with a small change in, in, in secondary structures. So there's obviously some kind, of, but they're still folded. I mean, they're still pretty much largely folded. But there's some structural change going on that's induced by the oligomer, which is allowing this, uh, induced by the detergent, which is allowing this oligomerization to take case. And we can actually measure the rate of this oligomerization, which is quite slow, um, which would suggest some sort of unfolding, partial unfolding, or unfolding, refolding of the back or back in order to produce this oligomerization competent species. Another interesting thing is that um, there are some disulfide mutants, and I'm sorry, I, I will put on this the, the, the thing. There are some disulfide mutants that have been shown not to allow um, membrane permalization. So there are some disulfide mutants that cannot produce apoptosis. And when we put some of those mutants um, into tween, um, we discover that they actually don't, they don't oligomerize either. So we infer that this oligomerization is related to the capability to, to, to puncture the, these pores. So let's have a look at this mechanism then. If I take a mixture of back and MCL1, I've already told you, this is in buffer, I've already told you that they don't interact. If I now add detergent, if I add detergent to back or backs on their own, here are the oligomers, you can see that mass spec here. But if I add MCL1 instead or on top of or after, what we can see is all we get now is dimers of back MCL1. We simply wipe out all these larger oligomers by adding MCL1. 
So what MCL1 does, it, it outcompetes these oligomers and we form tight dimers between back and MCL1, presumably because MCL1 binds tighter to back than back binds to itself. Now we take that mixture and we add puma and look what happens. Now we get back the oligomers of back or backs and we've got now dimers of puma and MCL1. So puma outcompetes MCL1 from uh, outcompetes um, for MCL1 from back or backs, and now back or backs are free to form the oligomers. And it's important to add at this point that puma alone does not inhibit oligomerization, nor does it promote oligomerization in the absence of, of, of detergent. So puma plus back or puma plus back does not cause oligomerization to occur. We did some kinetics, which I'm not going to share with you now, which give us an insight into the mechanism of what goes on. But, but this is what we think is happening here. We think that it's the presence of a membrane-like environment which is causing a structural change in back or backs, which allows them to oligomerize. But because the affinity for MCL1 is higher than the affinity for itself, back and backs are sequestered by MCL1, and that keeps the cell happy. But once we get the signals from cell damage, DNA damage, uh, from capsaids, which, which causes the presence of these BH3-like proteins to be present, the puma or the bid can outcompete back or backs for MCL1, which are now free to oligomerize to form pores. And our results are consistent with an indirect activation mechanism. There was some suggestion in the, in the literature that um, puma or, or could actually itself um, induce oligomerization in induced oligomerization here, but all our evidence suggests that it's this competition for different part binding partners um, which will affect this. So what I've been trying to argue in this, in this second part of this talk is that because IDPs are exquisitely sensitive to changes in condition, that disorder can result in signaling systems that are highly susceptible to changing conditions, which means they're ideally suited for signaling networks, which is where we find them in cells. The big challenge, of course, this praises to biology, is trying to design disordered systems. Um, I was lucky enough to be invited to RosettaCon last summer, and it's clear that people working in design are, ex are, are fantastic at designing structured systems. They can design switches, they can design things like this. But the problem of designing disordered systems, since these are so central to biology, um, so much signal transduction, so much um, transcription, uh, involves disordered systems, here's a big challenge to people in the future. Can we design these disordered systems in order to, to, to design our, our signaling networks? So disorder, even though at the moment I feel disordered, I would argue it's not always a bad thing. I want to again thank all the people involved in this work. I miss being a scientist so much, I can't tell you. And the thing I think I miss most is working with brilliant um, young people like this. Um, I want to um, thank all of you for coming along. All 500 are still here. So, oh no, 499 it's gone to. So there's one person just dropped out uh, once I said that. And, and just to encourage you if, if you, some people got the link from me or from other people, but if we all, Mail Gilad, he'll make sure that we have access to the website to hear the next talk. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen now and uh, look forward to talking to you. Thank you. Well
Thank you so much, Jane, for this uh, very intriguing and very exciting talk. <clears throat> and I'm sure that there are many issues that are still requiring a lot of research in the future. And I'm also sure that there are many issues that will raise questions right now. So I see that people are starting to ask questions. So let's start one by one. Uh, so uh, the first one is Franz Mulder. Uh, can you uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question? Yeah. Hello, Jane. Hi. Hi. I have a question about size exclusion chromatography. Um, how big is the worry that uh, the, uh, the presence of the matrix is a factor in the oligomerization equilibria that you observe? Um, and can you, and how can you check for it? Or how do you uh, check for it? Uh, we didn't check for it, is the answer to that question. Um, first of all, we know that back and backs oligomerize um, and uh, that the others don't. So we know by mass spec that the others don't oligomerize. And we, so we've got the mass spec to compare with. What we don't know from the size exclusion chromatography is what the size of our oligomers are. And we don't know that because um, in tween, the size of the micelle is the same as the size of the oligomer we're getting out. With some, um, whether, whether, it, whether we form an oligomer with a, a detergent depends very much on make sure we're, we're above the, the critical micelle concentration of detergent. And with some detergents, the micelle is smaller. So our, our, our micelle with the oligomers in is, is, is larger. But we know that we've got oligomer in there. Um, and and we, can, we, can, we can compare our mass spec results with the other. We've also done cross-linking within detergent. Interestingly though, when we add, I, I didn't get these results in, if we add guanidinium chloride, um, we get partial unfolding and then we get oligomers forming. So the intermediate is an oligomer. So the monomer partly unfolds, forms an oligomer at, I don't know, two molar guanidinium or something, which then unfolds later. So the oligomer is certainly something formed by a partly unfolded form of back and backs. Hope that answers you. Yeah. No, I'm just asking this also generally because uh, there's other oligomers in, in protein aggregation pathways and stuff and where you're often interested to know which things are formed and in, uh, in which proportions. And uh, I'm always, always a little bit worried with those kinds of results. I'm not sure if I need to be, but... Yeah, I don't know. I could probably ask Basil, who did the experiments, to comment. Basil, can you unmute yourself? Can people hear me? Uh, yes, uh, sorry. Um, so I, I, I think that there was certainly a worry, this idea that would it be non-specific oligomerization, for example, as you mentioned with the oligomer. Um, what made us more confident in the result was the differential effect on the different members of the same family. So we had, uh, as Jane presented, the MCA1 and we have other ones, but mostly the, the impact was that we had this Corroboration between what we expected from the known biological function and the biophysical sort of response to, uh, in this context, um, the tween. So that's what made us confident that was more um, related in a kind to what we observed in biology as just a random form of aggregation. I hope that answers the question. All right. Thank, thank you. Okay, we have a question from Ben, and we are going to try to keep it short because there are so many questions, so we want to try to give everybody a an opportunity. So Ben, please. Yeah, Jane, beautiful talk, beautiful work. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, I, I'm, I'm puzzled by your on rates. I mean, this is something that's a very common observation also in folded proteins that the modulation of affinity is mostly through off rates. Um, but the fact that you're observing this very uniform on rate sort of indicates some sort of limit for how quickly a helix can bind to something else. And it's kind of surprising to me that something as simple as a helix shouldn't be able to bind any faster. So I, I was wondering whether you know of any cases that do bind much more quickly with much higher rates. Uh, and if not, what, what, what do you think is the, the limits? Why is it limited to 10 to the 6 or something? 
Well, there are some that bind faster, but that they tend to be um, they tend to be steered electrostatically. Um, you know, so if you've got electrostatic distance, you can get them to bind faster. Mm. Um, I, 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 but Sarah did some work on uh, disordered proteins that did seem to suggest that disordered proteins do seem to bind faster than non-disordered proteins. But it's very hard to do because you've got to to take um, I, ele electrostatics into account and, and all sorts of things. It's hard to find data that's all there. I don't know is the answer to that question, but maybe uh, one of the things we do know is that our transition states are all relatively early, the ones we've looked at. So you don't need a very transition, structured transition state, so may maybe the, the barrier isn't that high. I mean, for our very highly disordered proteins, you really, you are indeed into the fusion limit. You get 10 to the 9 and higher. Um, so the, the disorder certainly helps in, in some of these cases. But yeah. it's, it's remarkable that even a simple helix cannot do much faster. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ben. We have a question from someone called Emiel or Emiele. Do you hear me? <clears throat> okay. Well, if not, then uh, Gary Owes has a question. Yeah, Ben asked my question, so I'll I'll let other people go. That's it. Okay. Uh, then we'll go to. Uh, Trishit Banerjee. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your lovely talk. And my question is a little bit similar uh, uh, to Professor Schuler's. And um, I, I was just find, uh, finding it a little difficult to understand that why is the K of uh, such an important factor? And what would have happened if uh, the K on would have been much more regulated than the K of? Uh, will we have something similar mechanisms or results? I, I, I think. I, I think there's two two parts to that. I think if you're a if you if you're a signaling system, you want to you want to control the amount of time you keep that signal on. Hmm. So what we find with 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 um, with the kinetics of MCL1 uh, of puma binding to to MCL1 is it's regulated by the rate at which Bax comes off MCL1. So you, you wait for dissociation of this before the other one can go on. And I think that's what biology cares about. It cares about the lifetime of these complexes which are around to do a particular job. And actually it's easy to evolve those because you just, you engineer the binding surface to be a better fit or a less be better fit. So it's easy to, to evolve that. So it makes sense on both ways, I think. Thank you so much. Okay, Hagen has a question. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jane. Really fantastic results. Okay. Uh, let me join Ben. Thank you. Uh, Jane, you, you said uh, something very interesting. So, you sort of from, from your experiments, you would conclude that the sensitivity of IDPs towards solution conditions would be a great uh, tool to, to use them for signaling and sensing. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I, I could also imagine that this, this could be a massive disadvantage if you think about regulatory systems that need to. Be, that need to work very precisely. So uh, my question would be, do you have any evidence that disordered proteins are more frequently used in sensing regulatory systems than in others? No, but that's a really good question. I think we should look it up. Um, right, I, I haven't found any data. I mean, I, I, but, but what it, I mean, what it would mean if you've got these sort of these systems where you've got many different proteins, I mean, you know, many of these, these, these hub proteins combine lots of different things. So in some conditions, you'll, you'll be more on this side and some you'll be more on the other. You can tune the relative sensitivity. Right, of the right, 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 and right. I think that would be a good project for somebody that's at home, can't do experiments, can go into the, into the data and you find a good bioinformatician. Find a good project, yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Cassie Joyner? Are you still there? Great talk, Jane. Um, Thank you. Puma as a BH3 act, you know, binder, but how do you think other more direct activators of BACs and BAC, like TBIT or BIM, might alter kind of the you know, modification or modulation of oligomerization induced fire detergent? Okay, you, you say TBID or BIM, you say direct, direct modulators. And, and I mean, our data with BID, we get the same effect as Puma. So what I think I'm doing is challenging the idea that actually they are direct regulators. 
because uh, in our experiments, we did use TBID and we got, it, it behaves like Puma behaves. Okay. So we are inferring that it's not a direct modulator. That's the bit, that's the bit that makes it dodgy to get it accepted. I, I um, uh, but that is, that is what we're proposing. Our data don't support in any way. We can add Puma to, and, and bid to back or backs with detergent, without deter, uh, or, or uh, um, uh, um, without detergent, and we cannot make it oligomerize. We just add detergent, which would be, which we're inferring is a membrane mimetic, and it oligomerizes. So the, the, the ground state is oligomer, and what the others do is, is MCL1 and, and the other BCL2 things stop it. And bid and puma interfere. That is our model. And you're right, it's not necessarily um, accepted yeah. uh, wisdom. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. That's okay. Okay, we have a question from Helen Xiao. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Okay. Um, so I'm curious, um, how would you envision other types of detergent, for example, like spitter ionic detergent would affect the oligomerization of the backs and, and the back? Um, we did try different detergents and, and Basil will tell you what happened. Basil, please. Uh, yes, uh, so we tried a few other detergents, um, only non-ionic detergents, though I, had to, I have to say we never tried um, lipid-like uh, ones, uh, so I can't answer mm. for this. For the other detergents, we had, in broad strokes, I would say similar results, as in like above the CMC and everything, we had also the mm. oligomerization propensity. Um, they were not identical effects, and one other aspect is that the uh, tween has such a low CMC that actually the fraction, the molecular fraction in solution was much lower than some of the ones where you needed sort of 2% volume in order to mm. get it um so it was also a bit more like i think better because we affected fewer of the other solution properties by having uh, less sort of molecules of the other detergent that with through indenture with some of the other detergents sorry. gotcha thank you okay next one is uh, gabor nagi um hello uh jane i wanted to ask if you know whether Puma has some interactions or changes in the structure, uh, which depends on the detergent as well. No, I didn't. Well, I don't think we use detergent with Puma. No, I mean, we've, we've tried other things. Basil, can you interfere again? Uh, yeah, I, I, if any, I can't remember from the top of my head, if any would have been very minor, um, okay. but, but certainly there wasn't any enormous like fraction. It, it, it remained disordered. So there might have been a slight gain in helicity potentially. I'd have to go back and double check, but nothing that was very striking. Okay, thank you. Okay, Eileen Jaffe. Uh, thank you. Hi, Jane. Um, uh, my, my question has to do again with the rather uniform rate of the rather uniform on rate. And I always think about systems in terms of conformational selection rather than induction. So if you think about it that way, could the limiting rate be the rate of formation of that helix from a equilibrium of alternate structures for that section? Uh, no, uh, uh, our, our results, all the experiments we've ever done with any of these systems, and we've tried with several systems, suggest that we are not dealing with conformational selection here. That we're, we're absolutely dealing with um, induced fit. Um, and that um, we have done some five value analyses of some of these systems. And um, the transition states, as I was saying with Ben, are very disordered. And so nearly all the order comes post-binding, is what we've discovered in all. So we've had no evidence at all for any sort of conformational selection things here. Um, that's what our experiments show. And in fact, simulations um, that have been done 
of, of the Puma system and, and of um, uh, the Kid Kick system also seem to suggest something similar. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so Adriana Miele could not uh, unmute her microphone, so she asked me to ask her a question, which is, would you hypothesize that the buck backs are associated to the mitochondria membranes? Are he ready to act? Um, well, they, they do have a membrane, um, a membrane spanning helix. Um, or, uh, and so they are associated with the membrane, although the data seem to suggest in, 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 the, in, um, in the literature that there's cytoplasmic forms of backbacks and membrane bound forms of backbacks. But we do know they associate with the membrane, that they have a membrane bound helix. But none, in none of our experiments did we have that membrane helix there. Okay, so the last question is by Gareth Morgan. <laughs> Hi, Jane. Uh, thanks for a great yeah. talk. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, two questions, really. Firstly, um, can you recapitulate the effects of the known small molecule inhibitors of, say, MCL1 on, in this system? Uh, no, we haven't. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I, would love to, I would love to do that. Yeah. Not that. Yeah. And then, do you think that the, uh, the oligomers of... Um, uh, back and backs that you're seeing a kind of uh, propagated domain swap type uh, structures where the uh, BH3 domain from one is interacting with the thing from the other, or do you think that they're less ordered? Um, we we didn't think at first, and then we came to think that probably there is some. It is propagated somehow through the BH3 swapping over. Although interestingly. Um, yeah, full stop. But we, but we don't know. That's why mm -hmm. we we tried. Uh, we looked at the, the the disulfide swap ones to see if and and there are some structures of domain swapped ones. And by looking at our cross linking and the disulfide things, we don't think that any of the domain swap structures that are out there are what we're seeing. But um, I mean, it's really frustrating. We, we, we've got no structural information at all. Um, <clears throat> the mass spec seems to be sort of dimers of dimers seem to be more common. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, it's not a dry cough, it's just a cough cough. <laughs> um, <coughs> they seem to be more, it looks a bit like it might be dimers of dimers. Mm -hmm. But they do see some trimers and things, so <coughs> just not sure. Um, we did see some really in Leeds, some people in Leeds did some initial kind of mass spec. And they did see some poor light things, but then they could never do it again and we could never publish it or, or anything. Mm -hmm. but we, we need, and they did cry OEM of, of some of our structures, but they could never complete them. Um, they did negative stain but we'd love to people to try <coughs> thanks <coughs> so i guess uh it's time to stop there were many many questions and i'm sure this was really intriguing and exciting for everybody and uh i definitely not enjoyed it enormously and i'm sure other people enjoyed it too you can use the reactions uh, button on the bottom to actually clap your hand <coughs> No, thank you all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jane. It was really thank you so cool. much, and thank you for organising this. And I will see you all two weeks today. Yeah. So I hope to see you all guys uh, joining us in uh, two weeks. We will try to actually uh, increase the number of slots that we have on uh, Zoom above uh, 500, and we will see even more of you online. So thank you again and stay tuned for uh, additional lectures and bye-bye. Thank you.